Good morning, everyone. I'm Willie Santiago. I am the manager of programs and resources. My pronouns are they, them. I am a fair-skinned Hispanic person with medium-length wavy brown hair. I am wearing a blue feather shawl with a white shirt. I want to welcome you all to this session. Um, we are especially want to welcome new colleagues, and we look forward to being engaged and challenged by your voices throughout the course of this conference as we welcome all perspectives. We're thrilled to have you all with us today. Our conference offers unmatched networking, showcasing, exhibiting, and professional development opportunities. And this year, we are thrilled to be celebrating a return to New York and sharing and learning from each other's experiences. APAP greatly values your feedback, uh, so we encourage you to please fill out the session surveys. There are little QR codes on all of your tables. If you scan them, it will take you to a session so that you can rate this survey. We are doing a drawing for one free conference registration to APAP 2025, so every single submission counts for one entry into the drawing. So please take the time to fill out the session. You can rate every single session that we are doing this year at the conference. And so with that, I want to wish you all an exciting conference and enjoy this session. And please be courageous and be curious. Thank you for joining us. Uh, oh, yes, that's right. Thank you for that note. We've been told that we won't be seen if we don't stand up, so we're going to navigate that together um, as we go. My name is Ashley Farrell Murray. She, her pronouns. I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a pleather little dress get up with a bow, a uh, long sleeved black tee underneath because I get cold easily. I have on black tights and black sneaks that are orthotic. Um, I am really glad to be here with everyone so early this morning. I'll apologize at the get up uh, for my conference shout voice this morning. Um, and we're gonna really just dive in here. Uh, the panel is titled The Future and Impact of AI on the Performing Arts, which we recognize is quite a big and broad topic and one that you know a lot of people are paying attention to right now. So we'll try to hold as many perspectives as we can. Um, as we go through. I'm going to start out with a brief frame and then I'll introduce our panelists and invite everyone to share a little bit about their work before we have a small thin synthetic conversation and open it up to questions. Um, today, some things that we're going to cover include different sector approaches to artificial intelligence, including administrative and artistic applications of artificial intelligence, or AI. Um, we'll talk about approaches to holistic uses of the technologies, trying to figure out neither going in the way of techno-romanticism nor technophobia, but striking that balance, um, considering what I like to think of as a techno-realist approach and thinking about what that might look like. Um, <clears throat> we'll hear from individual perspectives with an acknowledgement that this is a rapidly developing topic and that there are varied relationships to it. Um, we want to hold space for all of these in the room. We're happy to welcome folks who are here to learn and folks who are deep in this and using it on a daily basis and considering um, what its future applications and growth potential might look like or who have used it deeply and are ready to run in the other direction. Um, so we'll see where we get to. Um, um, so, uh, Mutali and Conde, it's right here, stand up. Um, Bianca Ferland uh, is joining us, Marianne Weems, and Anango Lumumba Kasango. Um, and this is kind of funny because I think we want to keep this like relatively informal and as a conversation. Um, and so, maybe we'll do a little like 
I don't know, weaseling up and down. Maybe we'll decide we all want to stand up at some point, um, but we'll kind of see how it goes um, so that we can try to be in conversation with one another while we're also uh, standing up a little bit. Um, so I'd like to share just a brief, brief little bit about each panelist. Um, Anango Lumumba Kasango um, is a first-gen black feminist rapper, producer, and scholar um, who was raised in Ithaca, New York with me. We went to high school together. Um, <laughs> the Gayokono Nation, otherwise known as the Cuga Nation, lands of, um, very proud to represent IHS today on this panel. Um, Lumumba now, uh, Anango is now a faculty member at Brown. Um, where she works on uh, the implications of sound, culture, and augmented reality through, I would say, practice and theory. Is that fair to say, Anango? You can dive into it. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna really also let everyone introduce themselves, um, so that we can really hear about how folks are framing this for themselves. Um, so Marianne, who's also here with us today, is a theater and opera director, founder of the award-winning New York-based theater company, the Builders Association. Um, Marianne has been a practitioner in the field of technology and theater. Is that fair to say? Ish. Again, a, a sort of. Yeah, we won't define things quite as such, um, but uh, has really kind of been at the forefront of thinking through what the frames of um, you know these machinations might look like on stage. Um, so very excited also to have Marianne joining us. Um, and not working for me here. There we go. Okay. So Bianca Fairland um, joins us as well, working on connecting technology and empowerment. Um, Bianca is an experienced professional speaker, and it was the creation of ProConnect um, that has come to define her speaking journey. ProConnect is a pioneering platform at the intersection of technology and empowerment, and is her flagship endeavor. Um, and we'll hear from Bianca about that a little bit and some of her other um, endeavors in the field. And um, Mutale, also uh, with us, is a visiting policy fellow at the Oxford, in Oxford Internet Institute um, and CEO of AI for the People. Um, really excited to hear from Mutale about what that initiative looks like and um, her work in and around that. Um, and so with that, I would, I'm really excited to share with you these four perspectives. Um, I should also say that I am the arts program director at the Doris Duke Foundation. I've been there for only about five months, and before that, I was at the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center uh, for the last almost decade, working as a curator in theater and dance, but also across music and time-based visual arts at the intersection of media and performance. Um, so while I'm moderating today, I also kind of hold the hold the perspective of those two two identities. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn us over, and I will be timekeeping today. Um, I think I'll verbally cue to everyone as we go, and we'll begin with Mutale. Good morning, everybody. This is my first time addressing an audience like this, and I would say I have. You should definitely congratulate yourselves because it's 10 a.m. on Saturday and you're here. <laughs> and if this were a tech conference, not only would we not have a bunch of women here, but there would be nobody here at 10 a.m. <laughs> so very quickly in, in terms of the work that we've been able to do, I am a, a technologist. I look much younger than I am, but I've actually been in the field for around 15 years. And in that time, the thing that really brought me to the arts communities is that as a product designer, when we're thinking about new innovations like ChatGTP, which I know many people have been speaking about over the last year, the first place that we go are the arts, specifically science fiction. But um, for those of us that are coming from non-Western viewpoints, for those of us that are feminists, we have to look broader. So much of the work that I've done, um, specifically in my career in um, within social media companies, has gone to the worlds of choreography. If you are on social media, you know that a dance can help you get to an election. It can also help you um, find 
critical medical care, for example, if choreographed properly. I look to the worlds of video. I'm somebody who's a, who was a filmmaker many, many years ago, but um, there are not very many first generation immigrant filmmakers because their parents tell them to get real jobs. So um, that, was my, that was my story, but coming to social media, um, having graduated with my undergraduate degree almost 30 years ago prior to social media, but coming as somebody who knew how to v cut film, edit film, produce sound, meant that when Twitter pre-Elon Musk came around, I was actually one of the first people in the world to use that platform and to help them explore around what that would be. So I'm definitely coming to this conversation with something of a not necessarily technophobic stance, but a technocritical stance, because I understand the power of it. I understand the underlying logics, which are capitalist logics that are gonna flatten experience to get content out. And the work that AI for the People does, specifically on the policy front, and what I'm hoping to discuss with you all today, is what does it mean to own and create and profit from the incredible work that all of you do in this field while you are using the tools. Because while you use these tools, which is what we want, you are also training these tools, you're also refining these tools, you're making them more valuable for somebody who does not care about your art and does not care about um, any, of, any of you individually. And we really stand in those policy places, whether it be the UN, US Congress, or the EU, and say, no, artists are what brings us uh, civilization. They are what pushes humanity forward and they should be protected. So I'm really excited about speaking to you. Hello everyone. My name is Bianca Ferland and I'm here on behalf of Booking House. Uh, Booking House is actually a booking agency that's uh, primarily books tributes. I work as an assistant for Booking House with 15 agents. I know, it sounds like a lot, but that's okay. I use AI. <laughs> now, my position is new at Booking House. I was on the other side of the industry. I was a presenter. I took care of a venue, and when we are a presenter for a, for a venue, we find ourselves wearing many, many hats, and I was already using um, AI technology, um, AI plugins and different applications for everyday uh, tasks when it comes to promoting an event, scheduling a pr uh, an event, writing a, rewriting a biography. And when I was asked by Booking House to come on over, um, I let them know that when they told me that I would be an assistant to 15 agents, I told them that I would be bringing my AI technology over and they were like, what is AI? What is AI? And I'm sure a lot of people in this room have that question. I, so I took the time to empower each individual person to teach them what AI is and how to utilize AI. Uh, AI. Sorry, I'm from Sudbury. This is my first time in New York. This is my first time speaking in, uh, in the States, so I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. I just hope that in the future, AI can't replace me and have me here. <laughs> um, but I'm, so in saying that, uh, ProConnect was mentioned, and ProConnect is something that I do um, on my spare time. Um, it's where I bring together entrepreneurs in my community, and I put together uh, seminars and workshops that are called ProConnect, Empower Your Brand with the Magic of AI. And we start with the basics, and we work up to different levels, and we allow people to go out and uh, create different projects. So I'm excited to talk about this project, uh, uh, talk about this topic. It's some, I'm, um, I'm an avid user of AI, so I'm excited to hear how my other panelists also use AI. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning. <coughs> so um, I'm the artistic director of this company called the Builders Association, as Ashley said, and we've been around forever, we've been working for 30 years, kind of in this area, which is uh, essentially we kind of use technology to critique technology. So we've done uh, many different 
We've used many different forms. Um, we did a piece about outsourcing before anybody knew that there were people in Bangalore on the other end of the phone. We've done a piece about data valence. We did a piece about the 2008 housing crisis and how that was um, driven by technology. So here we are. Um, and I, I'm just gonna like be an artist for a second, I guess, and talk about our current project, which is um, this. Um, it's an election year project. And uh, you know this election is being driven by misinformation and disinformation, and we are awash in it. And the and AI is a big part of how that misinformation is being generated. So uh, we're kind of taking a step back and looking at the people who are generating AI, which is based in Silicon Valley. So. If you look at Elon Musk, if you look at Peter Thiel, one of their heroes is Ayn Rand. Um, and Ayn Rand generation is a uh, <laughs> hilarious writer from the 50s who wrote two, two amazing novels, um, Atlas Shrugged and uh, The Fountainhead. And essentially, her uh, she embodies the culture of greed. So she is a perfect point of departure for Elon Musk and that world. I think one of her models was all for one and none for all. So, um, so, we're, so we're working on an AI-generated candidate who is informed, who's inflected by Ayn Rand. And, um, but we kind of are using other more palatable, um, uh, you know, chat GPT-focused lenses to sell her through. So like Taylor Swift, Dolly Parton, Oprah, how would they embody these Ayn Rand, uh, you know, tenets? So, that's a ton, but anyway, it's a show called um, Atlas Drugged, and it's gonna be opening this fall at the Skirball Center right around the election. Hi, everyone. Um, so, Masale, I'm one of the uh, first-gen kids whose parents told them to get a real job. So <laughs> I'm an assistant professor at Brown in the music department. I'm also an MC and a beat maker, and I've been um, rapping uh, professionally, I guess, quote unquote, for the past uh, 10 plus years. Um, I find myself in these AI conversations um, after taking kind of a windy path. So I love video games, and I, um, have been recently working with various kind of video game developers to think about how we can build um, hip hop inflected uh, mechanics um, and particularly a tool for composing rhymes within the game context. And having been tapped to work on this project, one of the first things I did was try to check out what else was out in the universe that could um, deal with these questions of rhyme generation that plays with words and how we think about how words can be brought together in interesting configurations. Um, this was in 2019, and in the years since then, as you know, so many of the tools that we now um, almost take for granted, having to do with kind of uh, word uh, generation have become kind of commonplace. And some of the kind of anxieties that I think I was tapping into when I was first looking into um, how folks are thinking about what these tools can do within the rap context have become more pronounced in recent months. So some of you might be familiar with um, a kind of AI-generated Drake song called Heart on My Sleeve that kind of blew up the music industry in a lot of ways, right? Or at least um, threatened to do so. And for those who are unfamiliar, in April of last year, um, this kind of anonymous user released this song uh, that sounded just like Drake. It, it was, um, if I had heard it and not known that this was generated through a kind of Drake AI filter, I would have absolutely thought that this was a Drake song. And so this really uh, created a kind of wrinkle, right? Because prior to, I think, that moment, folks weren't really recognizing how much these tools can shift um, people's relationship to their own voice, <laughs> right? And so coming from the hip hop context, I'm uh, concerned about what the trajectory will be, particularly for black artists, particularly for artists who are on the margins and whose work has powered 
the music industry and who are often, almost always, left on the margins when the um, profits are extracted. So that's kind of the, the place that I'm coming from is, a, is someone who's a deep lover of hip hop music and someone who wants to protect other artists and make sure that these tools are uh, deployed in ways that don't destroy our life force. Thank you all so much. Um, it's really great to hear from each of you, and I think as we promised at the beginning, um, each of you are, are approaching this from different disciplinary or personal perspectives, which illustrates the breadth of capacity with this one tool. Um, I think it's hard to have like an AI panel, right? Because what does that look like? Like this thing can do pretty much everything. It's like having a panel about the world or something. Um, and so what I'd love to do is dig deeper even into those individual perspectives and really call them out for that um, because I think that they, they bring a real specificity to the topic that I really appreciate. Um, so, you know, I find myself in spaces where the topic of AI comes up often, and, and they're, they're more often than not arts spaces. Um, and I keep hearing the phrase ethical technology come up. Has anybody heard that phrase? Can I just see hands? Great, okay. Um, and so I, I wasn't sure what that meant. I felt like I could imagine what it meant. Um, and as we sat down this morning, Marianne, I sort of pre-circulated some questions to the panel, and Marianne was like, but what is ethical technology? And then we kind of started to really dig into what it could be. Um, and so I think for the, sake of, for the sake of the room, I'm going to share what I got from Google um, as a starting place because why not? I should just drop it into chat GPT, but I won't. Um, somebody else can do that in the room. I'm happy for that. Um, so a holisticai.com uh, defines ethical AI as the development and deployment of artificial intelligence systems that emphasize fairness, transparency, accountability, and respect for human values. So what I found really funny about that was it didn't really get me any closer to a definition of ethical technology or, yeah, than, than I yeah, started. Um, and so with that, I might turn it over to you, Anango, um, because I know that you have you know some real experience in the realm of ethics and engineering. Um, and maybe together as a panel and as a room, we can kind of tease out like what could ethical technology look like and is that a path that we might like to pursue? Sure, and um, I know that you would love for us to stand, but I'm okay with yeah. not yeah. being totally yeah. visible just in the yeah. spirit of I keeping things kind of conversational. So I'm, Inango's talking right now. Um, <laughs> so in terms of ethics, one thing that I, I didn't mention is that I got my PhD in science and technology studies. And uh, for those who are unfamiliar with this field, essentially it's um, an interdisciplinary field where sociologists, anthropologists, uh, sometimes engineers, um, information science folks are interested in thinking about the dimensions of science and technology that are socially constructed, thinking about histories of technology, ways that the tools that we um, take for granted um, are shaped by our values. And so while I was getting my PhD, I often TA'd kind of ethic, engineering ethics courses, bioethics courses, and um, it was a, <laughs> that experience was really eye-opening because a lot of the folks who were in the room were often engineers and computer science majors who were this was like their required ethics course, right? So first, most of them did not want to be there, right? So they were just like, how do I get an A? Like, what's, what's kind of the protocol? But the other thing that was surprising to me was that conversations that I um, thought were, uh, you know, kind of like folks were having about what these tools mean were really new <laughs> to these folks who were going to build careers in kind of science and technological fields. So the idea that our we should question progress narratives was often challenged. We had to talk a lot about like what is progress? Why are we pursuing that? Why is that a value? Um, in the context of ethics, 
one of the ways that I kind of saw it framed, particularly through the, the biomedical model, is like doing the least amount of harm. And so if we're thinking about this, doing the least amount of harm for the greatest amount of people. <laughs> and so that's one potential framework for thinking through how we engage with what ethics might mean for the AI context. Um, but I still, it feels lacking um, in many ways. And I think one of the things that we had discussed uh, is that so much of the risk is human sort of imposed in a way that in the sort of biomedical world, you know, diseases emerge and we have to make difficult decisions. But in this case, there are folks making decisions about things that will cause harm or they know will cause harm and are sort of bypassing any of the sort of guardrails that would make these systems more, um, you know, transparent or any of the other sort of um, frames that you were calling attention to. So I'll, I'll leave it there, I know more questions than answers, but maybe you wanted to chat a little bit about, you gave, gave this wonderful phrase that I was like very, very stuck on. Yeah, yeah, very briefly. Um, one of the catchphrases in, do you say uh, Marianne, Marianne Weems, look at me. Okay, no, I'm gonna stand up. Okay, no, here I go. <laughs> This is very brief. So um, one of the phrases that you hear a lot in Silicon Valley is acceleration risk, which is we're working, we're gonna get this out there, you know, move fast and break things, and then what happens later is not our concern because we're in the fast lane, we're doing acceleration risk. So that's a little catchphrase you might wanna keep an eye out for. Okay, that's all. Um, I, I think from my perspective, one of the projects that AI for the People's working on is with Google's responsible AI team. So we, in industry, don't necessarily call ethical AI or AI ethics that word because it means nothing and everything. But when we think about responsibility, I am, I am also on a PhD journey, so I will be probably drinking a lot of alcohol with you because it's so ridiculous and leading to nowhere, potentially. But um, I mean... <laughs> I already told you about the film career and the, you know, um, and, but, but anyway, um, but my mother will be proud. Uh, going, go, going on. Um, but one of the things, and, and I'm a social scientist, so um, again, very much in this uh, field of science and technology studies, and one of the things that we look at are how do we do the foundational research that gets us these, product, the, these products in the beginning? And within an industry setting, one of the things that you'll find is that it's the people on the margins that are saying, you cannot just test on the three people that you know in Silicon Valley who are all called Ted, all are billionaires and all have islands in Hawaii, that's not people. So because this thing works for Ted in Hawaii with the island does not mean anything about what this is going to do when this technology scales. When you go to Bangalore, for example, and you've decided you want to make your next trillion and you're going into an Indian market or the work that we really do, and I think Marianne, we are, um, we're, we're kind of aligned in this. We do a lot of what we call um, defending democracy work, which is really looking at how do large language models operate online and what language becomes uh, toxic language. So 2016, me and many other researchers um, started to get into hate speech, 2016. I mean, <laughs> why? <laughs> because, the, because the major presidential co a candidate in this country had said that Mexicans were were, were you know, made these really disparaging remarks, but what that did technically was then invoke much of this sentiment that was at the basis of how um, communications technologies are built. The first people to go online were the Aryan Nation, and they did th they did so in about 1983 because they had this great idea that if they could go online and if they could organize online, then they wouldn't be um, caught by the FBI and other authorities, and they could continue on this work. And so, when we think about from a research perspective, when I'm thinking about what is an ethical system, I'm often thinking about what was the foundational research that got us to this system? Why is the Drake song being able to be made? What's that built on? What were the logics? And to the point that Marion made, the logic is always make more money. 
So it doesn't really matter if you have toxic uh, language within ChatGTP. I always laugh when people are like, I'll put it in ChatGTP and find out. And I'm like, it's a Nazi. <laughs> like, just let it go long enough. Just let it go. Let that model run long enough, and that's, that's, that's where you get to, because we don't have guardrails. And then the other thing that we think about in terms of ethical AI is in this current financial system where we're seeing these mass tech layoffs, the very people that are going to be like, I'm, like usually when I work into tech rooms, they're like, oh, here she comes, Debbie Downer. Um, but the people like me are really the first to be fired. So the people that are surviving are on, on the business side. And from a business perspective, there is no incentive for this. So the, the pressure really has to come from the outside, from rooms like this, from communities like this who are not represented in, in these conversations. I'm I'm struck by um, I'm struck by capitalism. <laughs> you know, it's I think that um, yeah, your comments about it's always what's going to generate the most money. Um, it's something I think about a lot when I hear concerns around tech. It, it and this is Ashley speaking. Um, my response often is that it's actually capitalism that I'm more concerned about um, because it feels like capitalism is driving us toward a technical future that is irresponsible and that that might be one of the root causes. Um, so I appreciate your bringing up that, that frame. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, I wonder if I could ask you all a, a sort of light question, <laughs> but that I hope might lead us to less light places. Um, I wonder about, you know, as you've engaged in AI in various ways, what your biggest surprise was. Um, whether you entered with skepticism and found p more possibility than you anticipated or the opposite, um, or perhaps neither. But I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, here's what I kind of, preconceived thought um, and and here's what I found and I know you've all entered also at different stages and in different phases and for different reasons so I'm really curious to hear a little bit about what your sort of guttural response was um, as individuals Just really Sorry. speaking of technology <laughs> so um, just really quickly, I, I will say that when we started generating material for this candidate, it, you know, it's abundantly clear that you're still giving the prompts, you the human beings. So, and you know what came out of the writer's strike was a, a role called prompt designer. So those are people who are gonna be doing, writing the next scripts, but they're still people. So um, you are, you know, you're subject to this massive multi-language model, which is um, generating all kinds of misinformation and disinformation. But, and that's the point that you're still the one who's kind of driving it. So it's not going to come up with like an answer that you hadn't thought of. It's still within our grasp. I think is what I'll have to say. Um, I, I think for me, I came in as a tech. Um, enthusiast. I thought that, well, first of all, I was living in New York City and rent was high, so I was just so happy for the job. I was like, oh, wow, this is much better paid than what I'd done before, and I'd been um, a TV writer prior, so I was definitely enthusiastic, but beyond that, I really did think that technology could solve all our problems. Um, I came into the tech field around 2008 initially, so this is pre-Facebook going IPO, and our thought was that we are going to use these tools to connect each other, and that Google really was a, 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 giving us knowledge. We weren't thinking about it as being an advertising platform that can give you answers. Um, and I think what I found along the way was that the, the 
first of all, you're working in a corporate environment, and I can all speak to you later about how ridiculous corporate environments are, so there was kind of that. And then the other part of it was, for me, the turning point was one of um, my colleagues in San Francisco had noticed that, that Google Photo, this is before Google Images was publicly available, had labeled three black people as gorillas. And we knew because this was not a functional technology that human beings had been behind those labels. And we knew that it had gone through testing, it had gone through validation, and when there was an internal investigation, it was framed as a joke. And for people that have been um, racially harassed, sexually harassed, abused in any way, often what your abuser will tell you is that it was a joke that you're being too sensitive, that you're, and when I saw that, that for me was the minute that I realized that these are not technical systems. These are social technical systems that are driven by human beings and the human beings that have the power are gonna be the ones that shape them. And that's when I kind of got into this street fight with, me and a bunch of billionaires, which is really funny because I just told you I got into this to pay rent. So it was literally the poorest person <laughs> on earth, you know, against them. But but um, I still love technology and I still have a lot of hope for technology. And I think at the beginning of the commercialization of these systems that there is a window um, and I'm not gay. Like I'm in the street fight. This is, you know, kind of what I do now. Thank you. Thank you all. This is really... Um my brain doesn't usually function before noon, but I, it's like percolating right now, so this is exciting. Um, so what's one thing, a few things that have been surprising to me about um, some of my experiments with just some of these tools, one of them has been um, actually some kind of more sort of culturally sensitive responses to prompts than I thought I would receive. So for example, one of the early prompts that I started tossing into chat GBT was rap like this person. Generate a rap like this person or like that person, like Jay-Z or Nicki Minaj or whoever. And the first time that I typed that prompt in with Jay-Z, the response was, you know, I can't rap like Jay-Z. That takes a lot of time and energy. And if you want to um, become really skilled at rap, you need to practice, and here's some resources. And it was really surprising to me because, you know, within sort of broader cultural discourse, hip hop is so often framed through this sort of racist lens around it being very easy to do, right? Or that it doesn't require a kind of great amount of skill. And so that the system had recognized that in a way that, you know, people around me often had not was really surprising to me. Um, and I think was kind of an invitation for me to think about, okay, well, what could this look like if, if this were sort of the norm? Um, I also have been surprised by my own sort of emotional response. <laughs> um, because, you know, we, we study this, we have kind of a, a, as whatever rationality means, have a sort of rational relationship with like what these tools mean. But I think it has, um, been surprising to me how much I'm connected to the idea of credit and ownership even outside of a sort of capitalist system. So one kind of like thought experiment that I've played with is what would it mean if every artist was able to live with dignity and didn't have to fight or scrap for their well-being, they had a roof over their heads, what then would be our relationship to credit and ownership of the things that we make? What could it look like if we had a system where we did have a kind of distributed system for thinking about credit? I mean, I am, any album I make is just as much my mom's as it is mine, is just as much my professor's as it is mine. And so I think there is something really powerful about this idea of building a system that's not so invested in this really destructive individualistic idea that like you are the author and owner of this work, right? I think it's produced a lot of harm for how we think about our creative practice and it's a product of a capitalist system that requires us to have ownership to make money from the thing. So I think it, when I've thought about like what it would mean to release the idea of credit and ownership of my things, the things that I make, it 
has been a really productive tension where I'm having to unpack what is connected to that idea that I am the maker of this thing and like trying to um, dream about a world where I wasn't invested in that idea because it means then that I'm brilliant and I'm a genius and like I, I'm, I'm excited about how these tools can help us to unpack some of those ideas because I do think they're incredibly destructive for makers when we're in pursuit of being the sort of singular individual genius um, at the expense of community. So there's a few surprising um, things that I've come across uh, the last year and a half um, through my journey of utilizing different AI applications and AI plugins. Uh, but I will talk um, of, uh, of an experience that I had when I first started at Booking House about uh, six months ago. Um, as I was starting to use uh, ChatGPT, I was using it in a different way. I was asked to go look for routing dates, and we have an expensive software that they pay for to look for routing dates. And I didn't like what it was giving me. It wasn't giving me all the venues. It was not giving me all the venues. So I thought, why don't I ask ChatGPT? So the first time when I asked, I didn't get the answers that I wanted, but instead what I did, um, I uploaded a picture, I said, you know, certain radius of this, uh, venues uh, that, that you typically book this type of music um, has a capacity of between this and this. Give me a list of 25. Continue, give me another list of 25. Then I went to my agents and I shared that information with them. Next day, I don't know if anybody here knows of GigWell, but they gave a call to GigWell the next day and they ended their uh, account. I'm so sorry if there's somebody from GigWell here. I apologize, I apologize. But please, if you're gonna integrate Google, integrate everything that's on Google, all of the venues, please. Um, so that's one way that I've used it to find um, opportunities to find routing dates and also find venues that we didn't even know about. So that has been an eye opener, especially coming on this side of the industry. I mean, I come from a presenter side, an entertainment buyer. So um, another thing that did surprise me, uh, being new at Booking House, uh, I was started to utilize AI plugins. So I had an AI plugin that was running into the background of my LinkedIn, and um, if you received a message from me and an invite, it was probably the AI plugin. I actually acquired a few leads that, um, uh, so we got a few bookings for Hotel California out in, I'm so proud, out in the UK, Dubai, um, and then Tokyo. And that was all through an AI plugin. And I was able to grab that lead and give it to an agent. Now, my boss was telling me that they pay for devices like that. That blows my mind. I'm, I'm new to this world, so it, I'm quite excited to see how I can implement this technology. But I also am worried about what it's going to do for the artists, right? I don't want it to take away soul. I don't want it to create a new James Brown song. James Brown is gone. We don't need an AI with the Drake song. I thought that was Drake. Uh, we run a club. We played it. We thought it was Drake. <laughs> if I would have known, we would have never played it. So it's interesting to see how I've used AI, and it's interesting to hear how other people have been using AI, and it is here to stay. Mm -hmm. And if you are afraid, it is okay, we are all afraid. And it's important to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we have all of these people with different, different views of it, because the more of us that have different views, then we'll be able to really create ethical technology. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're, mm -hmm. we're going into that direction. Thanks. Right, so thanks to you all um, for giving us your perspectives. I, we would like to open it up to questions as well um, and continue the conversation that way. So, yeah, right up here. And I think, um, I'm not sure how we're doing questions, but if you want to just project so that the room can hear you and I'll try to repeat. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This has been very inspiring, and um, yeah, there's a lot of hope, I would say, 
um, listening to your uh, perspective on AI, being an artist myself and also a presenter, I think it's always, I don't know, it's interesting the way you frame it on ownership and credit and opening up the barriers because from an artist's perspective, you see the, the power of collaboration mm -hmm. and just letting your guard down and saying, I'm better when I'm with a lot of people and building community work more than just an individual. Mm -hmm. But then you run into the boundaries of, well, I have to sell my work and I have to be able to be profitable. So I have to set those boundaries, unfortunately. And I hate that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do see that being um, an opportunity for artists to grow in their practice. Um, but then it goes into that question, like how how are we gonna profit? How are we gonna put ourselves in the front forefront? Mm -hmm. I would say by diving into the technology probably, which is very, um, I don't know, it's intimidating. Mm -hmm. like, to me, I see as a choreographer, um, the possibilities of even choreographing through the, through the technology. Like if you think about it, prompts, mm -hmm. you do prompts with dancers and you work that way. Um, but how do you frame it? How do you get started? So I don't know any tips that you might have in uh, applications that are easy for artists to dive in because I'm like a newbie newbie. Mm -hmm. I have no idea on how to get started. Yeah, and I'll repeat the question quickly about sort of tips for artists to approach accessibly, to accessibly approach technology maybe for the first time, um, to think about using it as a generation tool while maintaining a kind of artist-centered approach and an awareness around boundaries and profitability. Um, I can speak to the boundaries really, really quickly. Once you use the tool to create art, this is Matali speaking, um, the IP for the art that you've created rests with the company. So one of the things that came up in the writer's strike and in the actor's strike was that Samuel L. Jackson had both an entertainment lawyer and an IP lawyer that looked over his contracts. Mm -hmm. So prior to this happening, his, his likeness, his audio, and his name could not be reproduced by AI systems. So I would say that prior to the creation, that you really need to think about what is um, unique and new that, that, that should rest with you and how can you protect that contractually and then look at using the platform at the, at the end. But th these are in like, I, you have to think about this high stakes, low stakes. Mm -hmm. The gig example, to me was a very low stakes example because there wasn't a critical harm to human life if you found 25 venues. If you live by your art, then not being able to say that I created this thing and this thing belongs to me and then I can buy food and pay rent through this thing might have other stakes. So what you would need to do is figure out what elements of the work am I doing that are non-consequential non to my being use AI for that, use the tools for that, what elements are really valuable, and what Samuel Jackson decided was that his voice, his name, his likeness was really valuable to him, so he protected it. I, sorry, I just wanna, I, I can't talk. follow on that. With the, um, there's an artist-generated uh, strategy called Nightshade, which is something that visual, you know, visual uh, digital engineers have created which scrambles AI code. So you, so it will say to AI, this is a picture of a cow when it's actually a picture of a dog. <laughs> um, so there are things that are happening now that are subverting this scraping mechanism. And I think Nightshade's a great example. Check it out. The other thing I'll mention is that um, Young Arts is a Miami-based, um, sort of funder, uh, arts organization, and they, one of their board members, Natalie Diggins, is working with them on developing a series of working guides. You can call, go to thearts.ai um, and find them. They're discipline specific, so there's one for theater, there's one for dance, there's one for jazz, um, <clears throat> there are others, and Natalie is collaborating, Natalie comes from the tech industry and is collaborating with industry professionals on these working guides, and they outline um, ways to use the technology and then things to be aware of when you're doing so. Um, they also outline possible paths forward in terms of um, you know, disclosing when you've used one of these generators or different topics like that. So I'd really recommend checking out thearts.ai. Yeah. 
All right, we we actually do have to give up the room. Um, I'm sorry that we only had time for one question, but I'm really glad that we did get to hear um, from the expertise of our panel. And thank you all for joining us. I'm sure that there will be time as the days continue for conversation around this topic. Thank you.